80% of dudes rapping, they ain't nice as me 98% ain't live the same type of life as me The judge gave me life and then they sent me where the life is be That level forward depth and vice, the type of stuff they like to see Two choices, fight or flee, I refuse to die a chump I've never been a mark, but damn it's scary when that riot jump I've seen dudes cry, get pumped, or some sexually brutalized I knew a dude who lost his life and he was only doing five Year long racial fights when homie all you do is ride Lonely days and nights have been a whole cause in suicide From the moment you arrive, you see the Mexican Mafia AB skinheads with big giant swastikas Pro-black philosophers, the BGF, the Kumi And Muslims who will murk you from the nation to the Sunni That MS was loony, quick to ride up on they rival Even Christians went to church, hide knives up in a Bible Political and tribal, the Crips and Damus The Long Beast, the Hubs and the Dubs and the Grooves The IE, the Bakersfield the day go pie rules the hustlers quick to roll the gangsters don't move whatever click you choose say what's cracking youtube it's your boy 16 to life and i'm back like i'm on a pro violation yard down now in the event you happen to like this story be sure to hit that like button also leave a comment and if you haven't subscribed to my channel then be sure to subscribe to the channel then also hit the notification bell that way anytime i drop a story you will be notified ASAP Rocky and you can hop on it whenever you're ready. Now, for those of y'all who do not know, I got arrested in 94. I was sentenced to 16 years plus life. I've done 24 years straight in the California prison system. And during that time, I accumulated some good stories for y'all. Uh, also, be sure to check my raps out. Never Gave Me Therapy is a song that I got, a video. It's on all major platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Apple Music. With that being said, let's hop into this right here. Um, from time to time, periodically in my comments, I'll get people asking, have the, uh, blacks, whites, and Hispanics ever came together in a united front? Because the California prison system is, a uh, it's a lot of racial politics. Um, you know, so if you're black, you only be housed with a black. If you're white, you only be housed with a white person, so on and so forth. Um, now when I say that it's segregated, I'm not saying that there is a, an ongoing war, you know, with the blacks and Hispanics, and we, we don't talk to each other, we're not cordial, you know what I'm saying, because that's not the case, it's just that sometimes uh, when a situation becomes physical, um, then nine times out of ten, it's going to lead to a, uh, to a race riot, you know what I'm saying, and so, uh, and the bad thing about, you know, the bad thing about that is if you're black, all the blacks run together now, and the bad thing about that, like I say, is the, the blacks, there is very little structure among the blacks as opposed to the uh, Southern Hispanics and the Northern Hispanics, you know, um, they're more organized, uh, greatly more organized. And so um, it's more, you know, it's more rules and it, it's structure and it kind of keeps things balanced, you know, with the uh, with the blacks by it being, you know, several different factions amongst the blacks. And you got the Crips, you got the Bloods, you got different um, factions inside those two organizations who don't get along. Um, you got the up north, up north brothers from up north, like San Francisco, Oakland. So you, um, um, mid mid California, you know, northern Cali, Stockton, that area up in there, San Jose. It's just so many different factions with the blacks that it's really no structure. So you may go to one penitentiary and it's a strict set of rules that um, the blacks can't do. You may go to the next next uh, penitentiary. There's no rules. It just all depends on who happened to be at that particular penitentiary and who is, you know, basically who's stepping to the forefront and taking the initiative to try to have things in order. And so um, that's the bad part about that. Now, you know, like I say, so I get periodically, I get questions that have the blacks and especially the Hispanics ever came together. Well, I happened to be in um, Salinas Valley. Uh, I, I would say it was late 19, 1996, maybe early 1997. Uh, and we were on the, we happened to be on the level four yard, the 180 D yard, D yard, upper yard. And I did happen to see the blacks and Hispanics come together one time, or at least try to come together. So here was a situation right here. Uh, in the past, when we would be released to yard, because I believe we'd only get maybe like maybe three hours a yard. They let us out for yard, like maybe at nine o'clock in the morning or somewhere we'd have to recall a little before 12. Then we could come out again maybe around one and we'd have to recall a little before one. Now, um, you could always go to yard if you, if you, you know, weren't at school or if you weren't at work. But on the weekends, for those 
like myself who did not have a job, then you weren't allowed to go to the yard. You know, if you had a job, you had a, 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 a special type of uh, privilege status, which is called A1A. At that particular time, I didn't have a job. It took me almost two years to get a job up there. You know, when you don't have a job, you can also only get one phone call a month. So it's pretty messed up if you don't have a job or you're not in school. So uh, now, so what was happening was when we would get released to the yard, we might be on the yard for 15, 20 minutes. Then they'd announce over the loudspeaker that they was recalling the yard. Everybody had to go back to their cells. You know, the reason behind this was that they claimed they, they uh, an incident had occurred on another yard and they needed the staff from our particular yard to go over there and help with that situation. Now, this went on several times over a period of two weeks, you know. Of course, when you got individuals doing life, doing a lot of time, and they're caged in their cell, they're not getting no outside activity after a period of time. They're going to get upset. You know, they're going to get mad. They're going to want to hit the yard, exercise, jog, holler at their partners, conduct business, or whatever. So this kept happening over and over. So at some point in time, uh, you know, they were starting to get fed up about it. Now, I never forget this particular day because it was a Saturday, and... I had to sneak to the yard because I didn't have a job. I was in the cell with Big H, also known as Big Heron from Compton. Uh, you know, rest in peace uh, to that brother right there. He was a real solid good brother. And so uh, how I how I ended up getting out to the yard, um, the yard was being released. I think like, I don't know, maybe um, I believe this was afternoon yard. And he happened to have a phone call maybe about 10 or 15 minutes before the yard was being released. Um, so... When they cracked the door to see if he was going to use his phone call, he told them that I was going to use it. So I, I went down to use the phone. Now, the good thing about that is there are no actual COs on the floor in the day room. All the COs are upstairs in the gun tower. And so I went to the phone like I was going to use the phone. Once I seen the CO wasn't looking, I went and hid up under the podium that's in the day room. Then about 10 minutes later, once they started popping the doors, releasing people who could go to the yard, I just joined in the crowd and was able to finesse my way outside. Um, so... Now, once we get outside, you know, the yard is going on. And like I say, at this point in time, I realized if I had if I had had any common sense, I would have stayed in the cell because Salinas Valley was wild, man. It was a lot of stabbings, a lot of stuff going on up there. And, you know, but like I say, I was young. I wanted to be outside. So so um, I snuck outside. So while we outside on the yard, maybe 15, 20 minutes, you know, uh, they did it once again. Recall the yard, told everybody to, to go back in now. At this point in time, you know, dudes became angry, like, man, you know, we tired of this. Now, I don't know who it was because at that point in time, I was uh, I was new to prison, you know, but I guess somebody went and, and, and talked to the Hispanics or whatever, whatever. And they decided that that they wasn't going back in. You know, everybody, you know, um, the blacks and the Hispanics. I can't remember. I can't say if I remember the whites participating, but I definitely remember the blacks and Hispanics. Like I say, maybe 1996, somewhere around there. So they decided they wasn't going back in. So they make an announcement over the yards, over the loudspeaker to recall, recall the yard, told everybody to go back in. But ain't nobody going back in. You know, we like we ain't going nowhere. So everybody just standing out, standing out, milling around, doing what they doing. So at some point in time, the administration realized that we wasn't going back in. They made a couple more, you know, announcements. Everybody go back in. You're going to get in trouble. You're going to get some write-ups, blah, blah, blah. Wasn't nobody going nowhere. So they ended up just left, left us out there. They left us out there and went to do whatever they had to do. They actually left us out there for a couple of hours, you know. And so we, everybody just back to, you know, normal, doing what they doing, playing, playing cards, playing, you know, basketball, whatever, whatever. So um, maybe in a couple of hours, I think they made one more announcement, told everybody they better go back in. Uh, wasn't nobody going nowhere. So now, uh, after a little period of time, we see the um, the wall open up. They got a little, well, they you can go behind where like the vocation and, and the um, medical and all that type of stuff is. They had like a little, um, it was almost looked like a little fortress. And you had to go through there and get checked and this and that before you could actually go back there to the where the program office was. You know, like I say, the canteen the uh, sergeant's office and stuff like that. They would check you and make sure that you didn't have any weapons on you or whatever. And so uh, they opened that they open that door and a whole bunch of COs, you know, in, in this type of like army looking fatigue, they come out there. You basically like the goon squad, a whole bunch of COs from other yards. Now, um, so now there's a little conversation going on. Everybody's starting to group back up again, the Hispanics, and we're up against a wall now, you know, so 
we're every they're talking now they're telling the hispanic dudes you know listen we're not going in we finish to stay down and they're telling us okay well you guys don't run we won't run we'll stay right here you know and like i say now it's a large number of um co's coming over there now keep in mind also that this is the level four so we're on a level four 180 which means that there is um you have um gun towers on the yard and in the gun tower they have mini 14 rifles you know they definitely going to if they feel you pose any type of threat to one of them COs, they definitely going to shoot you. Actually, back then, they had a uh, no warning shot policy. So in the event a fight or something like that would break out on the yard and they felt that somebody's life was in danger, they definitely was going to shoot. A lot of times, whoever they were shooting at or in that general area, somebody might get hit. 30, 40 feet away, sitting at the table drinking coffee, not even involved in the incident. So they wasn't they wasn't um, they wasn't for, for play when it came to busting that gun, you know, and, and a, a lot of cats knew that. And so eventually just so happened, the guards made their way to the group of Hispanics before they got to the blacks. Now, of course, so now, you know, everybody's saying, hey, look, we're going to stay down. We're going to stay down. So now when they're moving toward them, of course, now we keep in mind, like I say, they got the gun in the tower. So they're not trying to get they're not trying to get too close and make any type of contact because then, of course, you know, anything could happen, you know, and so, uh, Eventually, you know, they started coming. The uh, CEOs just ran over there. Everybody's moving kind of like, you know, not trying to make a whole lot of contact with them and stuff. And they're trying to hold their ground. But the CEOs is coming. And eventually what happened is they just started screaming, get down, get down, you know, get down. And so eventually everybody on the yard proned out. Everybody on the yard proned out. Uh, they handcuffed. I think they might have handcuffed some of us, put us in them zip ties and this and that. But eventually we, we was all allowed to go back to the cell. We was all um, just they gave us. 115s, which is basically a disciplinary action. And so, um, you know, that was the only time that during the whole 24 years that I was incarcerated, I've seen the uh, Hispanics and the blacks try to come together and stand together as one. Um, you know, I don't know why that doesn't happen often, you know, and a lot of people ask because if you look at it at the end of the day, we're all convicts, we're all prisoners, but the racial politics, I guess, is so, um, so messed up that you know, a lot of times that uh, for whatever reason, the two groups are just unwilling to try to, you know, uh, come together in unison, even when it's in support of something that may benefit the uh, the convict and the prison population. So, uh, you know, I don't know. But anyway, that's my little story on that. That's the only single time that I've seen that happen. Uh, hope you like that little story. Be sure to hit that like button. It's your boy 16 to life. You already know what it is. Resume normal program.